Welcome to Second Congregational Church's video newsletter. I'm Reverend Sean. I'm Reverend Max. And we just want to fill you in with all that's happening here uh, on uh, our campus. Absolutely. It's been a really busy week here at 2CC yet again, and it's sort of amazing because on some level you look at the campus, and the campus is very, very quiet, except for Molly Guerin and her new scooter, and <laughs> Emily Grant and her old scooter, and uh, uh, Ashley Guerin and uh, Max Guerin kind of doing laps around the Mead House just to try to get in, get burn off a little energy and, yeah. and get a little outside time but the cars are really down to a minimum. We put sawhorses up in front of the driveways this weekend in order to begin to really limit access to campus for, for various folks who might be cutting through. And so we're sort of hunkering down, but there is a great blessing for the Grant family and uh, the other residents of campus. At least we get to hunker down together. Yeah. And so that, that has made it easier for us. And we're really aware that many of you are not in that situation and you're hunkering down very much on your own and uh, so our hearts go out to you we know how how vital having one another has been just over the last week and so as we're entering week two of this with a bunch of other weeks yet to come figuring out how we're all going to do this is something that i think each and every family is just beginning to think through and learn and it and it isn't easy so uh so we're thinking of you as you do that and hope that you're finding good ways to get out a little bit into the sunshine and do all of the things that kind of allow you to be in a good frame of mind spiritually and mentally and physically as we kind of go into the next phase of, of what this whole thing is going to be. Yeah, and I, I was thinking about that as I was working on the sermon for Saturday night. Uh, you know, my I had plans to... <laughs> to write a, you know, something theologically deep, you know, but, uh, and I, I still do, but it's in a different way. It's, it's more of, you know, I'm leaving my house uh, to come over here to the office and write, and, you know, here my wife is homeschooling our son, who everybody knows is, you know, has a little extra energy and likes to do what he likes, yep. and uh, my daughter's exercising and, and doing some uh, gym work you know the the teachers sent a lot of uh curriculum home with parents right including yeah. pe curriculum yeah. which i was sort of like hey yeah. I, I, thank you actually for that <laughs> part I, w that would not have been obvious to me and yeah. yet uh, i'm glad that somebody i'm glad somebody knows my child yeah. because my child has needed that and 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 molly too probably i just hope next week it's not dodgeball oh then... <laughs> oh no I'm, I'm i still have issues from dodgeball <laughs> There's always that guy that's throwing it. Always that guy. It's like, are you always. Roger Clemens? Absolutely. <laughs> uh, but yeah, I was, you know, observing that, and uh, it made me think of just how everybody's adjusting. Yeah. Uh, life does that to you. Mm -hmm. uh, sometimes, you know, you have a plan, and then life throws you. Uh, speaking of throwing things, a curveball that Absolutely. you just can't yes. hit. Yep. And. You know, I was thinking about just how God had uh, worked with human beings, and it, it, it wasn't always an easy process. The, it, it's a really big book because there were so many <laughs> <laughs> deviations, Absolutely. so many different directions, and it's so interesting that God ends up, where does God end up, at least according to our story? Right. Here. Right. He right. throws up his hands and says, I got to get off this throne right, right. <laughs> and come down there and figure out. And what does Jesus do for most of his life? Right. Yep. He lives. Yep. Simply lives. And that is, that is why, to me, you know, seeing my wife adjust to everyday life reminded me of why Christ is my Savior. Hmm. Because he lived everyday life and found a way uh, to make it divine. And yeah. to make even bad things uh, uh, positive, I, I look at the. I was looking at the cross one day in the chapel, mm. and it's lit up. And I said, "Oh my! <laughs> that cross also is the symbol of positivity." Yeah, That's literally, right. a positive symbol. Hmm. 
How can somebody take a cross, an instrument of death, and turn it into something positive? Well, Max is going to tell us in a couple of weeks, right? Right here. Well, here's hoping, right? E- Easter is around the corner, and yeah. Easter is the day when the church really proclaims that par excellence, right? That's what people. That's why people come, and the church. We we sometimes forget in 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 the day-to-day lives that we lead. The reason that the church exists is because of Easter. Hmm. And so Easter is this day when the church proclaims all of the hope that we find for the future based on who Jesus is and was. And so connecting with that, reconnecting with that, hearing and, and, and living that is, is something that we are invited to do each and every day in different kinds of ways and yet on Easter Sunday this is a day when the church lifts up just how important that kind of proclamation is for our ongoing life as people of faith and so it it is a a really really wonderful day and we're beginning to put the finishing touches on our own plans for what that is going to entail in this new context but I actually want to come back to one thing that, that you're saying is you're kind of getting your head around what the sermon is going to be for Evensong on Saturday night at 5 p.m. The thing I think is really interesting is, you know, kind of where is God in this moment hmm. and how do Christians grapple with that question? Because I think a lot of people are grappling with that question. And one of the things that I, I feel like I'm beginning to see, I don't know if you've started to see this too, how different Christian communities answer that question has a kind of wide range to it. And some of the answers that I feel like I'm overhearing (laughs) are, those are not my answers. Those are not the answers of of, of our particular faith community. And so I've always sort of felt like, wouldn't it be great if we could sue pastors for spiritual malpractice. I, 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 I don't yes. want to throw stones at other people's theology exactly, but but to say that there can be a flirting almost with a level of spiritual malpractice, I yeah. think is is very is real and 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 is happening at times like this when people are afraid and people are really looking for stuff. That that that's out there yeah. and. Um, so I was really interested in you talking about this idea of, of God found kind of operating in the everyday. And you, what, yeah. what's that, what is that for you, do you think? For me, I, and I, one of the books, and it's a short read, a book that you can probably get on a Kindle, so it doesn't even need to be delivered. Uh, it's The Practice of the Presence of God by oh, Brother yeah. Lawrence. Oh, yeah, that's great. And it's about this uh, monk who found God in everyday life, that washing the dishes, you know, something I hate to do. I made the bed this morning. You know, Ashley's probably going to remi- just put an asterisk that's only the second time he's done that in the past couple of weeks. Right. No, it's probably the second time in your marriage, right? The, fir- the first was the day after your wedding. And it, 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 now, now, now it's like time number two. Right? No, no. I, yeah, well, I, I'm finding... I, I, I would gladly sit and meditate for 40 minutes mm-hmm. and pray, you know. And, and I'm just being introduced... Through my through everyday life, just watching how you know now everybody's kind of close quartered, uh, yeah. so you get to see them a bit more. Yeah, and uh, I thought, what, what a better, what's the best way to start my day? Is it to sit down for thirty minutes and try to find yeah. God in my prayer and meditation, or what if I made the bed? Yeah, yeah, and took one chore off the list. Yeah. That's right. And yeah, I that, found God in that moment. That's, that's great. It's, you know, and, and Brother Lawrence is such a wonderful yeah, yeah. Uh, Classic. Uh, voice <laughs> yeah. to, to listen to in this, in this moment. His, and you, you've read it more recently probably yeah. than I have, but what I remember from when I encountered that book for the first time is this idea that whatever you do, do it as if it were for Jesus. Do it as, do it as if it were for Christ with the sort of the the implication because it is 
Yes. You know, it's the it's yes. the Christ in in every person that we're looking to greet and looking to connect with and looking to serve. Mm. And so when you wash the dishes, you know, if Jesus came down and bathed in golden light and said, you know what I really need, Max Grant, I really need for you to wash the dishes, I would be more than happy to do that very thing. And the point is, guess what? That's exactly what Jesus is doing. We, we may not have the lens that sees that, but this work of the everyday is so very important. And Jesus is in those kinds of details. And, and, and there's a, such a great opportunity now to practice that kind of spiritual discipline and to, to look for God in those moments. I, I, yeah. I think that's, that's great. This is, this is a good sermon. I'm going to have to listen to this uh, very closely when you, when you preach it. The other thing that, that I think is, is true for those who kind of come into this moment and look for God in different kinds of ways, you're going to encounter in popular culture a lot of Christian voices who will say right now that this reflects our failure to be faithful to the laws of God as they are outlined in Scripture, that because society no longer takes God seriously yeah. because we don't pray in our schools. we don't pray yeah. in our schools because of um, sexual orientation yeah. being something that is no longer mandated according to scriptural lines which is not that simple let me mm. just say that right up top nevertheless because of that God has withdrawn his protective hand and who could blame God after all that God is doing this and that's just not how I think of these times theologically yeah. I think this idea that God is operating in the everyday and that what scripture offers us is not a rule book that we need to apply but is a record of how people in their particular cultural moment have looked for God in the everyday and sometimes it's been really clear where God is and other times it's really not clear where God is in the everyday and what scripture tells us is not oh look in this place but this is how it feels to look mm -hmm. and this is what it feels to find God in these moments. And I yeah. think that way of reading scripture is more helpful for us now and doesn't yeah. have that kind of just boil it like down to top her. down. Yeah, and and yeah, the top down thing is part of that for me and also the um this idea that this is a rule book that we should simply follow. There's nothing simple about a faith life. Mm. It's just, it, I wish it was. <laughs> would that it were, would that it were. And uh, so how is it that we are formed to grapple in the ways that scripture invites us to grapple and our faith tradition invites us to grapple? This is really the question for us now in particular. And so that shift. Wait, to when the, you got married, didn't everything get perfect? The, the part that Liz, is, that yeah. Liz did, yeah, that part got perfect. Because oh, I thought when I just believed in God, everything got better. <laughs> Absolutely right. Absolutely right. Right. All I need to do is... And we're right. referred to as the bride of Christ, right? Absolutely. That's right. Yeah, there, there is this notion that I think a lot of people have that when I come to believe... Now I'm just sort of shooting yeah, free throws gone. till the buzzer, oh. right? Yo, I, I, I don't will, hate anybody anymore. I, right, I will die. I know where I'm going. Oh, like my it, back is right, <laughs> everything's, everything's great now. And um, that doesn't last for very long. No. It doesn't. It's the honeymoon. I mean, it's it, the honeymoon it, phase. it is the honeymoon yes. phase, and, and it doesn't last. And, and yet our traditions teach us that something more durable is possible for us, but it takes longer. And in point of fact, it's more beautiful yes. and more meaningful and that we get to grow in life and God is with us in that growing. Yeah. And maybe, maybe even God is growing too. Hmm. And that is the thing to embrace about that. How is this an opportunity for growth? How is any moment yeah. in our lives something with so much to teach us? And, and I think those are great questions to, to be yeah. asking. Uh, I was reading Psalm 23 this week, oh, yeah. uh, and my eyes shifted over to Psalm 22 by accident. Ah, oh, yeah. 
it's that famous passage that begins, my God, my God, why, why have, have you, you forsaken, forsaken me? me? Yeah. It's very interesting that comes right before Psalm 23. Oh, I've never thought about that. It That's kind of really interesting. overshadows it in the, in the uh-huh. sense that how David came to this conclusion of where God was, that he had cried out to the point. And it's, Psalm 22 gives you permission to question what God is up to. Absolutely. And it, uh, David's conclusion, as he's yelling at God, he says, I almost slipped. I almost forgot. If I look back at Israel and where we've come from, yeah. if I look back at my own life and see that I, despite the shadows and pastures I have walked, I am here right now. That's right. Yeah. And David says, there you are. Right. He does. That's right. And he writes that psalm. Mm-hmm. And so as we pray, Max, uh, how do you orient your prayer? When you're asking for prayer... Oh, it's a good question. Do you f- are you saying, God, fix this? Yeah. You've worked in hospitals. Right. And, I've worked yeah. in hospitals. I, and uh, I have a dear friend who is a UCC pastor in Pennsylvania now uh, who's a, a chaplain and a, a chaplain supervisor, Reverend Lynn Mikulak. And she's one of those just wise people that, that you get to meet in life. And one of the things that she says that I have really been keeping in mind lately is she really tends not to pray for outcomes. She doesn't tell God how she needs God to be fixing things. And she has tried to cultivate in her own life a discipline around looking at where God might be in the everyday of a hospital, which is to say in the, for many of us, strange nether world between life and death that is represented in a hospital and its everyday functioning, there is an everyday quality of how is God present in the work of nurses? How is God present in the work of doctors? All these people who bring their various skills to this work of healing and how is, how is God operating in those people through those people and in those moments and that's not to say so God do this but just to say God how can I sense more deeply your presence in this working and in all of the ways in which you are kind of filtering through these places and I'm really very moved by that I'm very moved by this idea of if we shift it away from outcomes and what we want do we develop the eyes to begin to see how God is already working? And it seems to me that's very, very important as a way that we continue to learn about where God is in our mm-hmm. lives, especially in the, in the hard moments. And yeah. so, so I find myself really, really thinking about that. And uh, I would be interested to hear how you guys are, are praying right now and mm-hmm. what you are thinking about and how, how prayer is... is connecting with God for you. Speaking of which, it's probably about time for us yeah. to say some of the prayers that we have on our hearts today. And um, so I invite you to come into a, t- into a moment of prayer, and I'll begin, and then Sean will, will, will Max, finish when you're yeah. done praying for it, could we, before I finish up, could we leave just a little space for the person listening? Oh, that's a great idea. To sure. throw yeah. To throw it in. So your, your prayer is going to be sandwiched right in between two pastors' prayers. That's right. His is really that he's like the anchor man for the prayer. So, so this is good. You're getting your word in. All right. Okay. But let us pray. Let us pray. Holy One, for all the ways in which you are with us in the everyday, we give you thanks. For all the ways in which we learn to look at those who sustain us those who do the work of healing, who do the work of teaching, those who feed the hungry, those who reach out to the lonely and to the lost. 
Lord, you teach us that anyone who reaches out to the least of those among us reaches out to you. And so as we practice your presence in our midst, help us, Lord, to grow as people who see you and understand all that is sacred, even in this time, especially in this time. Holy God, Max and I get lots of emails, texts, and those people know who they are. And if you're listening, Maybe you know that song by Joan Osborne, If God Were One of Us. God would definitely do everything much better and different. But inevitably the gospel story tells us about someone called Emmanuel, that God would become one of us, go to work, like one of us, grow up like one of us, go to school like one of us, deal with brothers and sisters like one of us, getting sick, being thirsty, hungry, like one of us. Jesus is one of us, and he faced every trial and showed us how to be loving, gentle, self-controlled, patient, faithful, all the things that represent what God is. So in this time, may we have the courage and the focus and the pleasure growing through this time with the God who walked with us before coronavirus was here and who continues to walk with us through it and will see us past it. If we cannot remember this, your son reminds us through the prayer he taught his disciples, we continue to be reminded by those words today, saying, Our Father, who art Lord in heaven, heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.